victims, both unborn babies and mothers. Because many are, are victims of this, of this society, the way we look at things. And so we have to look at these concerns, you know, uh, what is a woman's rights? Her rights to choose and the right to privacy. And, and, and the control they have over their own bodies. And I would be, I'd be willing to stand shoulder to shoulder with anybody to talk about the rights that you have, the privacy, and to choose and control over your own body. But when you're talking about a baby, you're talking about somebody else's body now, whether it's inside or whether it's outside. We also have to understand the rights, that these rights are important. And that even though uh, sometimes people are in physically abusive conditions or find themselves in a, in a, in a happening, uh, and happening out of inconvenience or at a very, very young age, it still does not change when I vote about what God has actually said. And, and, but, but see, that's a worldly standpoint. When it comes down to Christianity, we should not be making offerings about our right to choose and our right to privacy and the control of our own bodies because we have been bought with a price. We do not own anything now. We have given ourselves over to God for His keeping. And so our, when it comes down to privacy, you have no privacy. God sees everything. And he's, gonna, he's not going to close his eyes to what you have going on or I have going on. We need to also understand you, need to, you do have the right to choose, but you do not have the right to choose the outcome. Your choice decides the outcome. Your choice decides the outcome. So if you live faithful to God, then you have, a, you have an outcome that is a wonderful outcome that God has promised. But if you choose to shake a fist of rebellion in God's face, you cannot expect a good outcome. So you do have a right to choose, but you cannot choose the outcome. And we also need to understand that you do not have the right, and because we prove it over and over again, to, for a child of God, and for those who look into Jesus and look into the Word of God for, for, for example and for, and, for, uh, uh, and for guidance and for truth, you have to understand that when you talk about control over your own body, based on the life you live and based on what God revealed, it should be plain to you that you do not have enough control to control your own body. You need someone greater than you to do it. That's why God gives us His Spirit. That's why God gives us, releases us from all the blame, from all things we've done in the past, so that we can truly be who He designed us to be. We cannot, we cannot do that on our own. So we need to make sure that when, you, when, when it comes down to people's rights in this country, that's one thing. But when it comes down to your rights and responsibility as a child of God and as a Christian, you need to rethink this whole idea of my right to choose my privacy and control over your own body. Because you have a master. You have a master who loves you. You have a master who loves you more than you love yourself. Okay? So, that being said, what we need to do is we need to start thinking about these things. We need to think about how that there's a woe that's been placed upon those who call evil good and good evil. We need to make sure that we consider, and we need to consider what people have done in the past and how uh, and what the outcome was for people who did not acknowledge God as being right or want to accuse God of being wrong or call something evil good and something good evil. See what happened to them in the past so that we can learn from their mistakes, not so we learn, not so we learn by our own mistakes. We need to also understand that we don't look to political, political politics to try to fix moral issues. You don't look to the government to fix moral issues. Okay? The most, a, the most a, 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 a government can actually do is deal with it civilly. But you can't fix moral issues. See, when you look at all the different things that you see, you'll see listed many things inside the, 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 the scripture. Where Paul, over more than one occasion, he actually lists different, different types of moral issues concerning con, con, uh, 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 confronting Christians even in that day. And what you have to understand, when he gives you all of this, his list, on this list many times, and this is going to bring us to our subject today, on this list many times, the first one he puts on each one of these lists is fornication. Now, even though that wasn't my lesson last week, I need to help us understand something very, very plain. You know, when, when something is added to a list at the beginning that many times, we need to understand the problem with that issue. Okay? Now, when you start understanding, uh, uh, when you understand, when you understand the problems that we have with morals, morals in this country, the only thing a government can do is deal with the civil consequences of things. But when you look at the things that Paul listed, for example, there's, a, there's a, when Paul listed in, in, uh, in, in different locations, and this is, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when Paul makes a list of things, when he makes these seven lists of, 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 of evil things in the writings of Paul, fornication is listed in five of them. Now what's interesting is, when you look at that whole list, 
When you look at all the things that Paul spoke against in those lists, and we're going to get there later on, do you realize only one of them, murder, is illegal in this country? All the other ones are illegal. Right. But all of them will cost you your soul. Right. But only one is illegal. Right. He lists seven things. So the most a government can actually do is deal with the civil part of this. You see, there is no law against fornication in this country. But what happens? What, the, what are the fruit of fornication? Okay. Now, here's my point. When you go back and you look at it, the reason I'm going to deal with sexual immorality now is because abortion is only a symptom of a problem. Because we talk about the majority of abortions did not happen because of somebody being raped or because of incest. That's like 1%. The other 97% is just for inconvenience. Now let's think about this for a second. Do you realize that there's a lot of things that are covering up just how horrible this problem is in this country? Because if you think of, who's that I talked about Planned Parenthood the other day? Okay? Well, I don't get too deep into that, but Planned Parenthood was doing something to help out, yeah. supposedly, right? Yeah. And so what Planned Parenthood is that, it was that Planned Parenthood was there to control a population, but a specific population. But let's just, we're not going to go there today. But my point is, control, population control. So here's what happened. When you have unwanted, when you're trying to avoid unwanted pregnancies, you actually have birth control. For the male, you have birth control. For the female, they often implant birth control. They have oral birth control, right? And then whenever, you know, you go too far and a pregnancy occurs, you got after birth control to where you can abort a baby, right? Now, here's the point. With all the abortions going on in this country, you know, that lets you know just how out of, how out of control fornication is, okay? But here's the point. What about all the babies that never get born has been covered up? All the pregnancies are covered up because of birth control. Yes. You see what I'm saying is if you took away the birth control yes. and you took away uh, the legal abortion, yes. you will really see, right. really absolutely see the extent of how bad fornication is Amen. in this country. Amen. You, it, it'd be mind-boggling then. But here's the point. I may not have all the totals. You may not have all the totals, but God still sees it. Amen. <laughs> so we're not going to get around this. Closing our eyes and feeling like it does not exist is not going to be, it's not going to work. So, so we're going to begin by addressing this moral issue confronting Christians. And, 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 the, and we're going to start this part talking about sexual immorality. Now, even though you don't see sexual immorality that written that way, sexual immorality is written as fornication, okay? And it's a moral issue that is faced by every Christian. Yes. Not some, every Christian deals with this. Now, I know a lot of times we like to think that we're holier than now, greater than now, no. Because what we have to understand, the statistics that we talked about before, inside the church and outside the church, there's no difference. All right? See, I didn't talk about, see, here's the thing. You know, I'm going to spend, we're talking to an adult audience here. I'm hoping we're talking to an adult audience out there on YouTube and everything. But here's the thing. You know, I've been preaching for like 20-something years now. And I know a lot of times people think to yourself, like, you know, Brother Howe, you know, you're a man who actually respects God more than you read God's word. Look, you know, this is not something that I haven't dealt with. Yeah. Personally dealt with. Let's just yeah. stop playing these games now. Yeah. Yeah. Personally dealt with, yeah. you know. So we need to make sure, this is not me dealing with other people. This is me. Coming to grips with my own way of thinking in my own mind, okay? Yes. You see, just because I, I showed up on Sunday and said, oh, I love Jesus, really, really loud for being a very, very young man, 12, 13 years old, did not mean that I was not dealing with this issue. Yes. Okay? So my point is, it's, it's a moral issue faced by every Christian. And the Bible says a whole lot about it. And if the Bible says a whole lot about it, just like with any other subject that the Bible speaks a whole lot about, we need to slow down and look at this issue. Okay? Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, this is interesting. So, here's a sermon, Brother Mike, that a letter that's being written to the church at Thessalonians. It's not written to the world, to the church. And notice what he says here in chapter 4, and verse number 1. He says, Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, 
that as you have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, he's telling the church that. So what does that let you know what's going on in that church? You see my point? You know, a lot of times people think that they just write stuff willy-nilly. No. When Paul was writing a letter, he was writing a letter for things that were going on at that location. And he said, abstain from fornication. Okay? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. He wrote this to the church of Corinth. In verse number 16, he says, What? Know you not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. So, what you have to understand, you see that fornication, this is an admonition to flee fornication. What's the word flee mean? Run. Run away from it, okay? Flee fornication. And, and, and this lesson is needed much in our, in our day because fornication of sexual immorality is rampant in our culture. You know, there was a time, now, see, let me just say, you know, well, let me get there in a second, okay? Morality is loosely defined and, and redefined, encouraging many to engage in sinful behavior. The definition of morality that I read inside the Bible dictionary and in the dictionary, principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior. So, principles that distinguish between right and wrong and good and bad behavior. The problem in our society is that the word morality is loosely defined and redefined. What used to be bad, ain't bad. Right. What used to be considered good, ain't good no more. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You know, and I, and I bring this up just so you understand. That was a time in this country, if you'd have stood up against open sexual immorality. For example, you know, I, I lived in California for a long time. They have the dude operate there every single year. Now they move the dude operate to Florida also. Y'all know what the dude operate is? The dude out parade. Y'all know the dude out parade is? Y'all never heard of the dude out parade? It's, a, it's called a pride parade now, but it, sounds, it used to be called a dude out parade. That's where it started in San Francisco. And so what happened was, you know, it's one of those, you know, those what they call pride parades. And see, you know, again, when you talk about worldly people, you can't expect, you can't get mad at worldly people for doing what worldly people do. So that's the whole point, okay? But here's what happened. So what happens is dude out parade, what they do is that they would actually, you know, march because they got rights and put their displays and their rainbows and men walking hand in hand, women walking hand in hand, but it turned from that, sister the turn, I'm telling you, it turned from that, to people walking down the street doing sexually explicit stuff to where they're walking with no clothes in the streets, they've been protected by the police and everything, right? Now, here's the thing. There was a time in this country that if anybody tried to prove, pull some stuff like that, the whole city would run them out of town for some stuff like that. Because the whole city, the morals of the city would say, no, that's bad, you cannot do that. So now, it's gotten to the point to where it doesn't consider it okay. And anybody who says anything that against it is bad now. Yeah. So you see how the wars have changed. Yeah. Let me help you understand something else. This has happened every single year for, I don't know, it's been going on. I've been here almost, here almost 20 years now. It was happening 20 years when I, before I left California. Yeah. And it's just gotten bigger and bigger, right? But here's what people don't realize, okay? Someone brought up the, you know, that, that many of the laws that we have in this country are based on moral standards that you read about inside the Bible. Moral sense. You read about it inside the Bible. That's how we got conditioned what was right and what was wrong at the time, right? And for many, many years, the people that did these things always kind of kept that stuff to themselves because they knew it didn't go along with the mores of the, of the side that we lived in. Because the standards that had been set by what we read from the scriptures. But here's the thing. Do you know that the dude operate parade happens every single year, okay? And if you get to march up and down the road, they got the right to protect our police because they got the right to freedom of speech, right? Yes. Here's the thing. Here's the part you don't catch very often. You know, every single year, there's a group of people that go stand on the corners where the parade is going by and just read Romans chapter 1 out loud. They've been doing that for years now. You know what happens to them, Jim? They get arrested every year for hate speech. <laughs> Reading the Bible out loud, 
So in other words, you got the right to, to flaunt, you know, your debauchery and everything like that to show your naked body. And then you can't do it no other time, but during that parade, it's freedom of expression. But the people standing on the corner in a public place just reading the Bible out loud can get arrested for a hate speech? But think about that for a second. You see, when we understand that this whole thing, the whole, the whole uh, uh, definition of morality has shifted. I'm not saying that there aren't people who use the Bible in a hateful way. Because I know there's people that can do that. Right? I'm not talking about that. But think about that. It's like everybody has the right in this country to say anything and do anything they want. But those people who believe what God says. <laughs> You believe what God says now in this country, all of a sudden you're the bad guy now. Yeah. Remember when the Miss America, they asked Miss America her opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the guy, the guy, the interviewer, yeah. who was obviously openly gay, asked her her opinion. He said, how do you, what do you think? Here's the question. What do you think about same-sex marriage? She said, I think, think about it. He's asked, I think it's wrong. Man, they bashed her. Yeah. They, yeah. Oh, they beat her up. Like, first of all, why did you ask her what you think? He asked me, in other words, you don't have the right to think because of your faith in this country. Only ask us, what do you think? She said, I don't think it's right because of my faith. She didn't say, he didn't say, is it right or wrong? He asked her, what do you think? And she said, what I think. And man, they just roast her. They beat her. They destroy her in the media. So obviously, this whole idea of morality is it, it, is is shifted, and we defined it in the when we very first started this whole this whole thing that God decides what is right, and God decides what is wrong, and if God says something is right, it's right. There's, there's nothing you can do to change that because matter of fact, there's nothing you can do to change God's mind because God's mind is already settled in heaven. You know, it's settled, meaning He's settled. You know. And God's mind, and so what you have to understand, you need to waste, stop wasting time trying to convince God to change his mind and waste your time convincing yourself that God is right. Amen. That's it. So when you look at this whole idea of sexual immorality or fornication, the word defined as sexual immorality derived from two different words, okay? Now what you have to understand, you know, the English language is a language that, that's a, that's, that's a language has been a, a copulation of many different languages put together. But you actually have, when you actually look at the, the, the biblical use of it, the way the biblical translator is translated into English, there's two different words that is used. One is fornus and porneia. Okay? What's interesting is, is the word fornus or porneia for, uh, is, a word, is a Latin based word that simply means to burn. It makes a reference to an oven, to burn. Now, so, and when you get the, when you look at the Greek word porneia, the root porneia, kind of the same thing, but it's also when we get the root the word pornograph, pornography. But the root word is to burn. Now you start thinking like, okay, what does that, I, I'll show you what I mean. I'll show you what I mean. Go to Romans chapter 1. This ain't my lesson, but I want you to see what I'm talking about here. In Romans chapter 1, in verse 24, it's some of the reasons that the Gentiles are guilty before God. In other words, even though they don't have the, the law of Moses, they still, God can still hold them accountable based on things that they do know, okay? And in verse 24 it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also men leaving the natural use of a woman burning in their lust one toward another. Men were then working that which is unseemly and receiving, the, uh, uh, receiving in themselves that recompense of their own error, which is neat. So when he's talking about that burning one with another, what is he talking about? In other words, it's this desire, this drive to have something that you should not be having, right? And so 
we understand that this is something that this is something that has to be addressed. There, there really is. I don't think there's a harder issue to bring under control. Okay. So the root word porneo, porneo is is, is is tied up into burning. Okay. It's a burning. And so, and, and, and so what it is, it's, it's a form of, it's, 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 from, it's, it's a form of a, 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 a un, illicit sexual intercourse, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, intercourse, even with animals. So what fornication is, in a nutshell, is any unauthorized sexual activity. Any sexual activity that is not authorized and blessed by God. How about that? So, yes, yeah, so fornication is a, is a very broad word. Now, now I'm bringing this as broad word when it comes down to sexual immorality. But it's not a broad word where it means the same thing. For example, I'm going to say this again because many people don't catch this. You know, if, for example, I read uh, the verse that I read earlier, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, oh, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, no, let's do it this way. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, let me show you something here. Paul is talking to the church of Corinth, and he says in verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. So you know why he wrote the letter, right? Because he, he wrote it because they had fornication happening there. Among you, which, uh, and such fornication is no, so, not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And so what you have to understand is that he's explaining what fornication actually is. Now, here's the point. And for those who kind of want to keep beating me up over this whole thing about uh, the New American Standard Bible giving you a more accurate definition of this word, all the New American Standard Bible does is take the word fornication out and puts the word immorality in it. It doesn't say sexual immorality. It just says immorality. Now, Sam, is stealing from your neighbor immoral? Is lying to your brother immoral? Right? See, those are all immoral things. You know what? Y'all going to make me prove it. Just because I know this ain't my lesson, but I need us to understand it, that the game is getting played on. And if I had read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 1, you wouldn't know what I was talking about. So those who want to say this is more accurate, when you understand that, se that fornication is any unauthorized sexual contact between people, and even if it's a person and a person and an animal, that's fornication that's unauthorized by God. Okay? Right. So listen to what first first Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says in the New American Standard Bible, and see if you can prove sexual immorality from this verse. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles. Is fornication immoral? Yeah. You see my point? Oh, yeah. Now, what is the now? I brought up a point that the word, the word has gotten so the, the morality, more the uh, morality has been so defined and redefined that it doesn't have the same meaning anymore. Amen. And I'm gonna let you know, some of these Bibles are the culprit. Mm -hmm. Among Christians, the Bibles are the culprit because you cannot prove sexual immorality anymore. Right. Let me help you understand. To the point where a lot of the words that are very, very plain inside the scriptures, I'm talking about Christians now, I'm not talking about anybody else. So the words that are very, very plain that you can plainly understand and plainly define have been taken out and watered down to where you cannot prove it anymore. Right. To the point that I said this a long time ago when we started this whole thing, that eventually you're going to get a Bible that you cannot prove sexual morality at all. What do we have now? We got the Queen James Bible, the way you cannot prove now. You cannot, see y'all laughing, but it actually exists. Did you know Brother Kelvin is a Queen James Bible? Go on Amazon and see if I can make to bring this up. They use all the wording for the King James, but all, all other words that has anything to do with, with homosexuality or same sex is actually changed. So you can't prove it no more. That's the Queen James Bible. You buy it on Amazon. And now it's 2012. I'm not even making this up, guys. The Queen James Bible. Matter of fact, bring it up so you can see if showing a picture real quick. You'll be horrified when you actually see, again, their, their symbolism, their imagery. Because here's the thing, Christians don't want. 
I'm saying face to face in the church, people don't want nobody to bring out the stuff that they're doing wrong. We're okay as long as you point at everybody else. But nobody wants to deal with this issue. And sexual immorality is a huge issue. Okay? So there's a prophecy that's going on then. Now, if you look at this, okay, what do y'all see? Queen James Bible. But you got you got a cross and you got a rainbow cross. Now, you think that's accidental? You see, this is real stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because what's happening is, is that just like we just like we talked about on Wednesday night, you know, there's always somebody, people are always looking, then they're looking to have uh, uh that they're keeping teachers, they don't want teachers that that, that just scratch their their ears. They don't want somebody that gives them an issue. They want people to say what they want them to say. And if you look hard enough at this, you ain't gotta look very hard no more, brother. You can you can find somebody that's willing to agree with what you want to hear if you just throw a rock in any direction. It's a little bit more rare to find somebody who would just say what God says and leave it at that. Right? Amen. Let the chips fall where it lays, right? right. Yes. You see, yes. see, <laughs> fornication was an issue back then to where Paul, writing to the churches, had to address this issue. He's writing to a church where fornication problem in the church. Now here's, here's what you have to understand. Do you realize, do you realize that if Paul came in and sat inside our church today, and just look around and just met the people and met some of the families inside the church today. And he would understand very, very plainly something very, very quickly. When you're talking about a group of people in the 21st century, whatever century you're in, inside the church, in, in, in Arizona, and this could be anywhere, and you just do a survey among a thousand people inside the Lord's church, and you ask how many young ladies and young men had children outside of their marriage, he would have to do a sermon on fornication, wouldn't he? Yes. Because babies outside of marriage don't happen by accident. No, no. They happen the same way. Yes. I didn't say that part. I didn't say, I, but my point I'm trying to make is, the only point I was trying to make is, is that the, the trouble facing the church is, is that the standard for morality has shifted so much. For people even calling themselves Christians. Now, granted, people calling themselves Christians are making them Christian. Okay? Yes. I'm talking about issues facing the Lord's church. Yes. Worldly churches, I still say that's the world. That does not, that's not the same thing. Amen. Okay? I'm talking about the church. Okay? So, so when you think about it, the issue was really bad at that time. Let me read some writings for you outside of the Bible of writings from the first century church about people at that time. Okay? Okay? This one, here's one from, uh, uh, from Demosthenes, uh, okay? Here's their attitude toward adultery in the first century. Just see if it sounds the same today. We keep mistresses for pleasure, concubines for day-to-day -day needs of the body, but we have wives in order to produce children legitimately and to have a trustworthy guardian of our homes. <laughs> now, this is, just, this, is, this is written in the first century, by the way. Listen to what Seneca had to say. Their attitude toward divorce. Roman women were married to be divorced and were divorced to be married. Some of them distinguished the years uh, not by the names of, their, of the consuls, consuls, but by the names of their husbands. That's the way to define what year it is. Okay, I was married to who about this year? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Brother Paul, uh, Brother Paul uh, Dobson used to start his sermon like this. He said, in the words of Elizabeth Taylor, see, you guys know Elizabeth Taylor. Right? He said, in the words of Elizabeth Taylor, you know, the words she said to her eighth husband, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> That's what he did. To let the guy know he wasn't going to preach a long sermon. But you know, think about all the husbands that they have. I shall not keep you long. <laughs> Their attitude toward family in the first century. Caligula lived in incest with his sister Drusilla, and the lust of Nero did not even spare his mother, Agrippina. And so you have to understand, a writer actually wrote that even in that day, the leaders had incest in their own house. The attitude, their attitude toward homosexuality. Now listen to this. This is actually written by Lucian. It says, "It were better if it, it, it were better not to eat marriage." But to follow Plato and Socrates 
and to be content with the love of boys. Hmm? Lucian said, it were better not to need marriage. It's better to not need, it were better not to need marriage, but to follow Plato and Socrates and to be content with the love of boys. You know, we always read about Socrates and Plato in school. They always talk, talk about that. You know, like they're teaching. But see, what they were talking about in that day, everybody knew that they just loved little boys. Yes. Let's keep going. Gibbons wrote, of the first 15 emperors, okay, Claudius, and we're talking about, we're talking about a Roman emperor. Of the first 15 emperors, Claudius was the only one whose taste in love was entirely correct. In other words, Claudius is the only one that loved women. No. So they had issues back then. So you understand a little bit more why Paul wrote this letter to Rome. Right? Because of the stuff that they were dealing with. Stuff that was normal. Stuff that, that was normal to them. And because it was, it was, it was strange to, to, to many people, but in that area it was normal. But see, think about it. In our country, these things are becoming normal. Yes. Huh? I try to tell people this. We need to pay attention to what's happening here because we don't understand, we don't understand just how bad this is. You know, you know, I was having a conversation with my other daughter, two sons, three sons ago. What was this year? About a month ago? Not very long, but my other daughter was here and we got talking, right? And I was telling her, I says, hey, you know, you know, we got to talk about the same sex marriage. I said, you know, here's the thing, you know, go back and do your research. The same person who actually uh, the lawyer who fought for like 50 years. Oh, yes, almost 50 years for the right for same-sex marriage in this country. Literally like decades he fought for this. Now that the right has been given, this same lawyer is heading up the rights of, of men to have man-boy love relationships. The same person. Wow. He's pushing for, because he's saying that, you know, there's some people, there's some men who are molesting kids who are taking advantage of young men, right? But there's some relationship that there's a true love bond between these two men. And those men that are in prison because of this, not only do we need to change this law, those men need to be released from prison. That's right. yeah. Do you know what you do you know what gay couples say about that guy? Like, ew, that's nasty. I'm like, but you think about it for a second. In other words, you're disgusted by the fact that a guy would actually hold a straight face and try to fight for the rights of people who have who have attractions to kids. As a matter of fact, this is another trend you have to understand. To the point to where even the, the, the name that they're getting called is being challenged. For example, there's people who 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 don't want to be called pedophiles. Right. Now, here's the point. There's a whole group of people now who reckon who want to be called math, meaning minor attracted people. People who are attracted to minors. Now they're saying like you cannot decide your attraction. But it's wrong if you take advantage of it. In other words, you give into it, then it's wrong to do it. But but they're saying that since you cannot change your how you feel about things, they just don't want to be called pedophiles with that stigma to go along with it. They want to be called maps, meaning like minor attract. We're attracted. So there's whole groups of people. Now think of this. So they're trying to get you to lower your guard down to not call them anything like it's a bad thing, like it's, we can't handle what we're attracted to. And now they're gathering themselves all in one place. Do you know the danger in getting thousands of people together who agree on some garbage like that? Yes. See, the stigmatism that goes along with it and the name that goes along with it is the one that keeps that junk down. So what I'm saying is being shifted. To where they're saying, well, we're feeling that, you know, just like anybody else, people should be, be just this, this whole thing with how you want them to call you by your pronoun or whatever else like that. People who have this, you know, this condition, they should decide what they get called. Now, I'll just show you how bad this is getting. So you know there's an actual, y'all know there's an actual, so y'all know there's an actual organization. This that organization is older than me called MAMA, right? The National Association of Man Boy Love, that's old. This guy's heading up their defense. Now, when I'm having this conversation with my daughter, she said, you know, Dad, that's ridiculous. I don't think, I think there's enough people in this country who would just stand up and just stand this wrong because nobody was gonna go along with that. I said, Kenya, you have to understand, if you would have asked me 50 years ago, do you think that two men could be married in this country? No, that can't happen. Right? You would never thought that, would you? 
progression right. because yeah. that's a progression because they're trying to condition your mind. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys have all seen it around town these billboards that say love is love. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're gonna make you they're gonna make you understand think, they're gonna make you think that that's pertaining to adult relationships. But is it is they're, but they're trying to what they're trying to tell you is love is love no matter what age it is. So yeah. you know if love is is love love is love still love and you're you know is a, a man and a boy. Mm -hmm. They're gonna ask you that question because love is love, right? Mm -hmm. It's a progression. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying to condition your mind to, to make you understand yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and, I, and I get silly sometimes on this, but think about that for a second. You realize now, you can, because of this whole way, you can identify brother as anything you want to now. So if, if he decided he wanted to roll with this, and, 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 and brother Stefan comes in next Sunday, he says, by the way, everybody, I just wanna make an announcement, I'm now a Chinese woman. Right? <laughs> and I want to be addressed as such. Like, wait a minute. Dude, there's no way. I can be anything I want to be. Dude, there's no way. You're not Chinese, you're not a woman. I can be anything I want to in this country. Now, you better think about it now. Check how silly this is. So if it comes down to it that, 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 that for example, that, that sex is not definite, then age should not be definite, definitive then. Now, age, sex is very definite, and age is very definite. In other words, if I ask you, Stephen, how old are you? Why are you not 60? But why, why are you not 60? You're not making 60. So age is definite, right? Right. So you can't be something that you're not. No, Why are you not 12? Already passed it, right? Will you ever be 12 again? No. You can act 12. And here's the point. So you think about it, but the way this whole thing goes, I know somebody's gonna go with it. Oh, I identify as a woman, so I can go to the latest world. I can identify as a teenage boy, so I can I can date 12 year old girls. Not being silly, but I would not be surprised with the way things are going. Because our, what we're doing, like Shemaine said, we're being conditioned to something. But you have to understand, just because times change, Paul was dealing with, God, Paul, God was dealing with these things even back then. And he did not budge on those things then. And what we need to understand is God has shown his disdain for fornication and we've seen it again and again. And no matter what anybody does, no matter how anybody tries to retranslate what God says or pervert what God says, it's not going to change God's mind because God's word is settled already. We just got to settle in our mind. So let's look at some of the things that Paul talks about when you actually see what God's position is on fornication. And not just immorality, specifically talking about sexual immorality. And we're going to look inside the New Testament. I'm not even going to look at the Old Testament just yet, but the, inside the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. What's the Bible says this again? 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 5, says again. Just keeps going down that road. 
So when a brother, somebody talks to a brother who's given over this, and not even trying to fix any of these things. He said, you don't have fellowship with a person like that. And the reason that we're struggling so much in the church today with these issues is because we never address these issues. That's right. That's it. Now, when you came out of the world, that's one thing. But and if you're inside the church and you're still doing it, that's another thing. But when you start trying to justify that, there's the issue now. In uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9 and 10, Joy.
fact that these people are already bluntly telling you oh. who they are. And here he said, okay, so they put that is this, this, this bumper sticker said blood eagle. And right under it says your neighborhood pedophile. Your local pedophile. Your local pedophile. And it has the witchcraft signs on the sides. Hey, it feels crazy, wow. man. And I know a lot of this were like a fact just to upset somebody. But see, yeah. people want to do stuff like that. What I'm saying is we're being deconditioned. We, we, we get conditioned to where we don't notice some things. I'm going to make two other points really quickly just so we get here. Okay? Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, Sister, jo uh, Sister Parker. Ephesians 5, 3 through 5. Now, 
premarital sex and wrapping them up teenagers. You know? Yes. Let me tell you something. I was actually teaching a high school Bible class here. Okay? Now, I learned that just to show you how slow I am on certain things, and this has been years ago, this is probably about 10 years ago. You know, I had to have a 13 year old girl in my Bible class tell me what sexting was. I never even heard about that. Now, granted, that's so not like, oh, I wonder what does that to be? Well, that's when you text things, you know, back and forth, you know. Uh, dirty language back and forth, and then you send pictures to you of yourself. I'm like, who in the world does stuff like that? Like, well, I know a lot of people do that. Wow. How, how can a 13 year old tell a 40 year old man, fill me in or something like that, unless you understand this whole society we live in is meant to corrupt everybody, even from a young age? Let me make another point. You know, when we're watching TV, I remember years ago we used to watch TV, we used to watch TV together, and I noticed a change in things. So I noticed things kind of changed, you know? And I noticed back in the 90s, right? Every commercial, like every other commercial was about some type of feminine protection, right? And I used to say, like, man, whatever happened to the, like, the peanut butter commercials and, and the Pepsi commercials, the Cheeto commercials, like, you know? And I would joke about that, right? <laughs> because they're like, you know, this program here. But then we started noticing on the TV shows. No matter what TV show you look at now, whether it's a, a TV show for adults, even a TV show for teenagers, teenagers, I'm watching TV shows. Every TV show that has come out in the last five years is without a doubt, if they got a love scene, it's going to have two boys kissing each other, two men kissing each other, yeah. or two. Every, it's like, why do you got to put it in every one of them? Yeah. Not some everyone. You think that's by accident? That was a time they didn't let people kiss on TV. So why do you think when you actually have a show that's targeted toward teens, that you have a teen that has a love interest of the same sex, and they're putting that out there, putting that out there, putting it out there, why do you think that is? Because they're shifting the mores of this country. It's called TV programming for a reason. So, so it doesn't take very much, it doesn't take very much to know that there's an issue. It takes effort. It takes effort for us to look at ourselves and be honest. Amen. And that's what we have to do. Because see, see, you're talking about my own family. You know, you know, I have nieces and nephews whose dad is, don't have the same dad and don't have, oh, I have you know, I, you know, that's my own family, right? I have my own family. My mom and dad broke up years ago over some garbage, right? This is stuff I we don't have to look very, very far. Right, right. My point is, is that. It should not be that way inside the church. No, no, no. No. And we need to take a long look at ourselves. Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the problem, Amen. and then we're going to look at the solutions that God has actually put in place for us right. to show us how we do overcome these things. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was at the park the other day. We were walking, drinking times of walk around here, and I was going to the ladies' restroom. where, you know, there's restrooms and they got separate stalls. It's not a big deal. But our country's a little bit different. We're talking about some moral issues. Yeah. When they're trying to yeah. force something, then yeah. we're all the same. No, we're not all the same. Yeah. 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 No, we're not. You know? And so we need to make sure we understand what God says is, is, is right is right. God says something is wrong is wrong. And we need to be ready to stand and challenge any of those things. Even if it's, even if it's especially if it's in your own life. You have to be able to stand against that even in your own life. Okay? So we're going, to, we're going to talk about, some, again, some heavy things. Amen. And we're going to show very, very plain again, in case you want to, case you want to bring your spiritual blindfolds, no, we're going to knock those off. Right. <laughs> Just so we can be honest with you next week, okay? <laughs> so I said that to say, I said that to say, mine, come in next week. Don't say, I ain't going to be there because I know how to be all, I'm just going to think about it. I'm just going to say what God said and kind of leave it at that. All right? So you know what we're going to be doing? All right, really good. That's all ready. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again for your son.